Welcome back, students. Now we have Lecture 5 on Homer's Iliad 2019, Homer's Iliad Book 1. We have talked about the structure of this poem. It was originally sung, sung in dactylic hexameter. Sung often, we think, during religious festivals over a few days. It takes uh, around 24, 30 hours, we think, to actually perform the entirety of the Iliad. But nobody has 24 hours to just be sitting around, so it would usually be spread out uh, throughout time. Something other interesting to keep in mind about the Iliad is, of course, it was not originally written in English, as it was not originally written. It was originally transcribed after being sung in Greek. Something interesting about ancient Greek, it originally had no capital letters, it had no punctuation, and there was no spacing between the words. You might now understand that we have those conventions because it makes it easier to read something in your head. They obviously spoke what they read out loud, and that was a convention that we still do. We still read out loud to this day. Uh, it's very hard to read in your head. We talked about the backstories of Achilles and Agamemnon. We know that Agamemnon had to sacrifice blood for blood, sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia to make it from Aulis with all the Achaean troops to Troy. And we know that Achilles has many stories about how he's mostly invulnerable, but not quite. Now, something to note to you. Homer does not believe that Achilles is invincible or invulnerable. In fact, we will see Achilles at one point injured. Small, little, tiny, itsy-bitsy, Itsy bitsy uh, uh, scratch from an ambidextrous spear thrower. But that said, if you can be scratched, are you invincible? No, you are not. And so he will be considered massively powerful and strong in this text, but he will not be invincible. And so you see, Homer will change the mythology of characters when it is necessary to his narrative, to his story. Let us begin. In the opening lines of Homer's Iliad, Homer tells the entire story of the poem in the, in, in the first seven lines. So I should say in the first seven lines. Those are traditionally called the proem of the poem. And in fact, we will focus on Homer's Iliad's proem, the Odyssey, the Aeneid by Virgil. We will focus on the proem of John Milton when we get to his Paradise Lost next year. We will focus on the proem of Dante when we get to him in, next year in the Divine Comedy. And in fact, when I teach that lecture, I will redirect your attention back to the proem of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And, well, since I'm talking about it, let me just read it as you write the notes on it. Sing, goddess, the anger of Peleus, the son Achilles, and its devastation, which put pains thousandfold upon the Achaeans, hurled in their multitudes to the house of Hades, strong souls of heroes, but gave their bodies to be the delicate feasting of dogs of all birds. The will of Zeus was accomplished. Since that time, when first there stood in the vision of conflict, Atreus, his son, the lord of men, that's Agamemnon, and brilliant Archelaus. Something I want you all to note in your heads, because I will quiz you on it, is that in this English translation, the very first word of the poem is sing. It's a command to the goddess. It's in the imperative mood, which we learned about in grammar class this year. He says, sing through me, goddess. Ooh, interesting. But the first word in the Greek is a word menin. It's the accusative singular of a word menis. You say, Mr. Schmidt, what does the word menis in Greek mean? I forgot. <laughs> and I say, oh, very good, very good. It means anger or rage or wrath. What is the very first word in all Western literature, therefore? Translated into English. Anger or wrath. It's like conflict starts what? Our entire civilization. In fact, uh, I may give you a reference to a very famous 5th century philosopher named Heraclitus, his pre-Socratic philosopher, and he says, all things begin in strife. You might want to think about that, because most stories become stories and not just planned events. When something goes right, or when something goes wrong. And so, perhaps all stories are the stories of what to do when things go wrong. Interesting. Very interesting. So... There will be a conflict or a fight between two Achaean leaders. Achilles, he is the strongest. He is the best at fighting. He is the LeBron James. He's still on, on the field of battle. But there is another man who is great. He commands more people. He has more power in terms of manpower, in terms of wealth, in terms of uh, force power, too, actually, literally speaking. He has more cattle. And remember that the uh, sign of wealth at this time isn't what how much uh, money you have tied to your credit card, that's far more sophisticated than the Achaeans had. It's how much land you have, and uh, therefore how much pasturing land you have, how much cattle you have, and therefore how many people you can feed, and how much you can sacrifice to the gods. 
Very interesting, very interesting. Any of you all farmers? Perhaps you understand that. No, nope, not yet? Maybe, maybe. In any case, Achilleus is the strongest and best fighter. You might call him LeBron James. You might call him Michael Jordan. Agamemnon is the strongest, most powerful leader, not the most physically gifted. So he's more like a Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson is a great coach. So it's like there's a very great coach, there's a very great player, there's going to be a conflict between them. Will that be good for the Achaeans as they fight against the Trojans to have their best fighter and their leader in a fight amongst themselves? Or will that hurt their odds of winning? What do we think? Yes? It will hurt the odds of winning. Right. If you have to fight on two fronts, is that better for you or worse than fighting on one front and directing all your efforts to that one pl place? Worse. Worse. It is worse. So, from the very beginning of the Iliad, we know that the Achaeans are in a bad situation. They're already in a war, but now they have internal fighting amongst themselves. Nothing worse than this, and we'll see just how drastic the consequences are. Many, many people will die. Many people that you will come to care for will die because of this. And so, conflict amongst an in-group is amongst the worst things we know. That's why one of our first stories is all about that. Hmm. All right. Hmm. As I said, because of their prideful conflict with each other, these two stallions, these two stags, these two monsters or mountains of men, Agamemnon and Achilles, as you might expect, since they are the elite, since they are the great men, it will not be them who suffers quite as much as the men who they command, the men underneath them. Though I will say this, it will certainly be the case that Agamemnon will pay dearly for this. He will almost be uh, ruined through embarrassment. And Achilles will pay a very hefty price as well. He will, he will lose something of great value to him. Something, something of utmost value, you might say. And what that something is, is subject to debate. There are actually a few very valuable things that he will lose over time. Potentially honor. Potentially a friend. Potentially love. Hmm. I suppose, I suppose it will be up to us to determine which one is more important, and it will be up to him to be sad about having lost all of that due to his own reckless decisions. And so, where does this all start after the pro? Well, Achilles has just sacked another city. We're in the tenth year of a ten-year-long war. We've been doing this for some time now, and Achilles, actually you'll find out in Book 9, has sacked 23 cities while at Troy. 12 by sea, 11 by land. He is undefeated. While he is on the battlefield, the Achaeans cannot lose. They are assured victory against these Trojans. Though when, we do not know. It has been so long. They did not expect to be here for ten years. In fact, you will soon find out that the Achaeans have ten times more soldiers than the Trojans. But the problem is, the Trojans have a very large wall around their city, which is hard to siege. The Achaeans obviously do not have siege engines. Uh, to go over the wall, like uh, the orcs from Lord of the Rings and the Two Towers. They just don't have that sort of technology. Um, and also, often it is the case that the Achaeans have to, because they have such a large expeditionary force and no farms, they have to pillage other cities in order to get, uh, well, essentially food, but they will also take, um, whenever they pillage a city, not only do they take food, they will take women as concubines and slaves, they will often kill the men, and they will also take their possessions, generally armor, sometimes bases, sometimes things that they would use at camp, like, um, like uh, tripods, uh, which they will put their food on, or hang their urns for food on. Very good. Okay. So Achilles has just sacked a city. And as I told you, something that is often taken from cities are women as slaves. They're called concubines. And so Achilles has actually acquired a new concubine. This is not his only concubine by the way, which we will see, because he has been very successful in battle. This new concubine's name is Briseis, and what you will learn later is that she's beautiful, and that he has feelings for her. He seems to have some affection for her. In fact, we will learn from his best friend Patroclus that Achilles has actually promised her that he will someday marry her, which would be sort of like the ultimate fantasy for a slave, because when you become married, you are no longer a slave, but rather what? Free or as free as a woman could be in these ancient times, which is, of course, much less free than we are in modern America. That said, Briseis is Achilles' concubine. 
Well, you say, Mr. Schmidt, but Achilleus is the strongest fighter. He is not the leader of the troops. Hasn't Agamemnon also received a gift from this sacking? And I say, yes. He also received a concubine. Her name was Chryseis. And that will be the beginning of all the problems. Because as the poem begins, an old man with a staff of Apollo, a priest of Apollo, a holy man, approaches the Achaean camp. He is a Trojan. This is a very dangerous thing for him to do. He's walking into the camp of an enemy. Perhaps they will enslave him. Perhaps they will uh, disfigure him. Perhaps they will kill him. And yet, probably they will not, because he is a priest. And if you mess with the priest of Apollo, by proxy, you are also messing with whom? Apollo. Apollo. And Apollo is a dread Olympian god. God of plague, in fact. So if you mess with his priest, potentially plague will afflict you. We will see this happen. Chrysus approaches this camp. He walks in. He sees Agamemnon, and he begs him. Agamemnon, please. I am a poor old man with nothing left to me. Release my daughter. I have brought a ransom for her. This is totally conventional. If you are taken as a slave, and your father is rich, the reason that we take you as a slave and not kill you, is so that we can ransom you. We make some money off you. Great. That's something that the Achaeans and Trojans definitely did. And so this is a very reasonable request. I'll pay you some money. Give me my daughter back. All the Achaeans shout out their approval for this. They say, that sounds fine. And so all the people that Agamemnon is commanding want him to take this deal. Do you think he takes it? He does not take it. And a big question I want to talk about in seminars is why? Why would you not take that deal? You have many concubines. Why not just get more gifts? All your people want you to give away Chryseis back to her father. They seem to think that's a good thing to do. Why would you act against that? Why would you be so pig-headed? And yet, Agamemnon rudely and arrogantly dismisses the priest. In fact, he says some kind of nasty things to him. He says... If you dare to come back here, it doesn't matter who you're a priest of, your head will roll. And those are pretty those are pretty strong words to say to somebody. Maybe if you're Agamemnon and talking to some commoner, that's how it can usually work. But this is not just some commoner, this is not just some peasant. This guy, what is his job again? I've already forgotten. Yes? A priest of whom? Well, Apollo's one of the top strongest gods. Do you think Apollo's going to take smack talk from some little insignificant mortal named Agamemnon? Absolutely not. So, Chrysus, what can he do? What can he do? He's been dismissed by Agamemnon. He's crying. He's never getting his daughter back. But he's a priest. What can you do if you're a priest? Something people still do. Something you look like you're doing right now. Pray to Apollo. Pray to Apollo. Yes, and well. So, the gods in the Iliad are very much present. They are very much real, they have bodies, and they are very much active in the affairs of mortals. And when a god feels that he has been disrespected, like Apollo by Agamemnon, he acts in order to assert his authority. And so, I told you, Apollo is about of many things, the hunt, light, the sun, prophecy, music, uh, but also of healing, and uh, the opposite of healing, plague and disease. And so Apollo decides to string his arrow and shoot it at the Achaean cattle. The cattle become sick. Well, during this time of heroes, imagine that every night you get to eat wonderful gyro or burger. What do you have to eat that's now sick? The cattle. And in fact, you might say, Mr. Schmidt, does that happen to people? I'd say, absolutely. Even in our own country over the last 20 years, we have had outbreaks of sickness amongst our food stores, which have led to sickness amongst us. Just look up bird flu or swine flu. It comes from our food stores. Got to keep them clean. In any case, the animals become sick. The Achaeans then eat the animals. What happens to the Achaeans? They become sick. A plague has afflicted them. And whenever a plague hits an ancient people, they start to wonder whether they have done something immoral, unethical, or wrong. Well, what recently was done? that might have been seen as immoral, unethical, or wrong amongst the Achaeans? What might have been done by their leader that would earn the wrath, the ire of a god, a god capable of making a plague happen? 
Yes? Disrespecting the priest. Disrespecting the priest of Apollo. You never get away with what in ancient Greek mythology? Yes? Anything. Anything. Correct. Very good. Hmm. Now, you would expect that if Agamemnon potentially called the problem, that Agamemnon would want to come up with the what? Solution. Makes perfect sense. And yet, for seven days, plague reigns. Seven days of war. These aren't just regular days. These are days when you already have something trying to kill you, the Trojans. But you also have a plague going on inside? This is a bad situation that needs to be dealt with. Well, in this culture, generally the person that calls assemblies, where you make big decisions about what to do next, will be the leader of the forces. That's Agamemnon. And yet, he waits, and he waits, and he waits. He does not call an assembly. People are dying. Something has to be done. Well, who's going to step up to the plate? Who's going to call an assembly? Well, it happens to be the person who is generally considered just as great or almost as great as Agamemnon, as we talked about earlier, Achilleus' greatest fighter. And so, something I want you to notice there is Achilleus is slightly stepping out of line. It is Agamemnon's job to call assembly, not Achilleus's. But yet, Ag Agamemnon is not doing his job. So, does somebody have to step up? Yes, and it's Achilleus. But this will cause friction between the two. It would be like if I decided not to teach you for a week, and then uh, in the back, my TA decided to stand up and teach. I might get upset at her for teaching. And yet, does somebody need to be teaching in a classroom? Yes, ideally it would be me. And yet, when somebody steps aside and does not do their duty, does not uh, commit to their responsibility, somebody has to step up. And so, Achilleus calls the assembly. And he consults their prophet, Calchas. Remember, Calchas is the prophet who first told Agamemnon that he would have to sacrifice his daughter. So Agamemnon probably does or does not like this prophet, given the news that he's given him before. Does not like him at all! So Achilleus says, Calchas! What is going on? We need to understand. We need to do something. We, we're plague-ridden. Probably this is because the gods are angry at us. You are a prophet. You can read the signs of the gods. Which god is angry at us? Why? What do we need to do to get rid of this plague so we can finish this war and go home? Well, great. Great. Calchas says, I would prefer not to say. That's pretty bad. The moment a prophet says, I don't want to say, probably that's because he's scared. Probably he's scared because he has some bad news to give to somebody who's powerful. Somebody who's powerful who could then punish him. Who's a very powerful man, even more powerful than Achilleus, would be capable of punishing anybody in the Achaean army if he received bad news from them. Let's get this answer and then I'll let you go. Yes, Agamemnon, Agamemnon will finish this in part two tomorrow.